Hi, welcome to Concordia. We are so glad you have joined us here for worship today. Our service will be about an hour long and include music, scripture, and an encouraging message for your week ahead. Our free app provides a worship guide and sermon notes if you wish to follow along. You can find the app by searching Concordia San Antonio in your app store. If you are joining us for the first time today, we'd love to meet you. You are invited to stop by one of the welcome kiosks in the lobby so we can say hi, answer any questions you may have, and give you a special gift as a reminder of your time here. Each week, our Sunday school hour begins at 9.30, including adult Bible class that dives deep into God's Word, Bible studies for junior high and high school students, as well as Sunday school classes for kids ages pre-K three through fifth grade. Concordia seeks to share God's love through service in our ongoing Love Essay program. If you are interested in volunteering here on campus or in our community, you can find current opportunities online at concordia.cc slash lovesa. Worship is about to begin. Thanks for being here today, and we hope you enjoy your time at Concordia. You are always welcome here. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. I want to thank our brass ensemble for the beautiful music uh, for our worship service. Well done. And I want to wish happy Mother's Day to all of our ladies. Now, you'll remember that on Mother's Day, we celebrate all of the women of the congregation. And we have a, a flower as you leave today that we'd like you to take just as a memento of our love and affection. The reason why is that it's not just moms who are moms by biology or adoption, but it's all of the ladies of the congregation who are called to be moms in their love for the rest of the congregation. So we are grateful for you, and we are thankful, and we hope that you have a wonderful day. We'll talk more about that a little later on. Right now, let's pray. Oh, <clears throat> one other thing. We also have pictures uh, after the service out in the courtyard. And so we've got a beautiful backdrop set up, and uh, uh, Ross Benton is here to take photos. Uh, and so please stop by and get a photo made before you leave today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day and for your blessings. Lord, we thank you for the women among us and the moms who, who are so tender and caring for us. We are grateful for them. And we pray that you will bless them and us, that we might be strengthened in body and mind to serve you with our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Friends, we make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, as we conclude our Detours series this morning, we're reminded of the Israelites who wandered, wandered all over the place, and the reality is that we wander too. We're often unfocused. Hebrews 12, 2 says for us and encourages us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Therefore, this morning, let's go to our God, our Father, and ask for forgiveness, uh, ask for forgiveness and receive that absolution that we so desperately need. You may use the kneelers in front of you or simply remain seated. We'll take a moment in silence to confess our sins in our hearts and then use the words on the screen to confess. Let us go to God, our Father. We confess our sins together. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you in our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We just Friends, I have amazing news for you. Almighty God in his mercy has given his one and only son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Please stand. The scripture reading for today is from the book of Hosea, chapter 1, where we read verses 1 through 4 and verse 8. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals and they burn incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness and with ties of love. 
To them I was like one who lifted up the child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Ad Adma? How can I make you like Zeboian? My heart is changed within me, and all my compassion is aroused. This is the word of the Lord. Please join me as we confess the faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God. Please be seated. Ushers, you are welcome forward so that we might offer up our gifts for the work of the Lord. Concordia, thank you. Thank you for your time, your treasure, and your talents uh, for uh, forming around us a community of believers to be able to serve uh, the Lord Almighty in all that we get to do uh, together. If you're a guest here today, welcome. We're thrilled that you're here. On your way out, you're welcome to uh, receive a gift at our uh, welcome area over there in the Narthex. And uh, you're always, if you're watching online, we're glad that you're watching with us. If you're ever in San Antonio in person, come and join us in person. There's also online giving available at concordia.cc and on our app. You are always welcome here at Concordia. Today is a beautiful day of celebration, a day to honor the women who've shaped us, nurtured us, and walked us through life. It's a day to say thanks to all the moms. Moms with toddlers tearing through the house, and moms whose babies have moved away. Moms who are doing this all by themselves, and moms who loved a child in need. Moms who have suffered unimaginable loss, and moms whose children are moms themselves. For all the times your love made things better, and the moments your wisdom made things clear, for the way you lived as an example, so we could see Jesus through you. For each and every memory that has lit the path we walk, we say, Thank you. Whether this is a day of celebration, reflection, or heartache, know that you are loved. Happy Mother's Day. What a beautiful reminder here on Mother's Day. Friends, just a reminder that we are a praying congregation and we would love to pray with you and for you. There will be prayer warriors up front here to be able to pray with you after the service. You can also submit a prayer request through Concordia's app or online at concordia.cc slash prayer. As we enter into prayer, you may use the kneelers in front of you or simply remain seated. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, creator of all things, there are so many things that detour us away from your love, that distract us from your care. Focus us, renew us, strengthen us today and always. We thank you for mothers. Mothers are awesome. And whether today is a day of joy or a day of reflection or a day of sadness, uh, give mothers strength today and always. We pray for the many birthdays and anniversaries happening last week and this week, those celebrations and milestones under your lordship. We pray for our Love SA campaign that we might go out and be your hands and feet to this community, to a community that so desperately needs your love. We pray for all those who protect and serve. 
We especially pray for uh, police, the police, firefighters, doctors, nurses, the military, first responders, and all those who serve under your lordship. Lord, thank you for all that you are, and we have so many prayers in our hearts, spoken and unspoken. We take a moment to lift those up to you in silence. Holy God, thank you for all that you are. Hear our prayer, even as we pray the prayer that your Son has given us in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Before anything else, wasn't that great music in that last song? Wow. She crushed it. And uh, in echoing our prayers and the video that you saw earlier, you know, on Mother's Day, we know that, that there's a spectrum, right? Some people are having the greatest day ever. And some people are really struggling. And there are all kinds of reasons. Sometimes it's about being a mom and, and, and things aren't the way they should be. There are things missing. There are things hurting. There are people missing. There are struggles. There are strife. All kinds of reasons. Sometimes it's about being a child and those same things apply. And so the, the thing that I want you to know, dear ladies of the congregation, I want you to know that wherever you are, one end or the other, anywhere in between, we love you. We're grateful for you and we pray we pray God's blessing on you. We pray that today the flowers and the conversation and the video and everything that happens is a reminder that we, we are grateful for you and that you matter to us. Now having said all of that, we're, we're going to dig into a, another message in this series called Detours. And you know, this has been such a happy-go-lucky kind of a series, hasn't it? Oh my goodness. Tough messages to preach, tough messages to prepare, and I'll bet tough messages to hear. 
Because we're not talking about detours like how you get around barricades or which road you take to get to a place. We're talking about the detours that, that sideline our lives, the kind of detours that, that catch us off guards and they take our plans and they throw them into the trash and they take us on a whole new path that's often painful, confusing, disappointing, con- uh, discouraging, all of it. Detours like depression. Detours like broken relationships. Detours like career changes. And today we're going to talk about another of those detours, maybe the most difficult of all. We talk about the kind of detours that happen when our children struggle. You know, there's the old adage that says, if mama's not happy, nobody's happy. Well, there's another adage that I think is equally true. You are only as happy as your least happy child. Isn't that right? I mean, it's, it's one of those sayings, but it's so very true. And so today, we're going to talk about our children and what happens when our children are on a detour, because when they go on a detour, whether we like it or not, we tend to go along with them. And it's amazing. Our children can be the source of our greatest joy, and they can be the source of some of our deepest pain. You know, I think about moms with little ones, babies and toddlers, and how they, they go through all of those scenarios with sickness and injuries and, you know, toddlers with terrible two temper tantrums. You know, driving moms to the point where they want to pull their hair out. And that's a detour, right? But then we also have the detours that come along as our kids are approaching those teenage years and they become too cool for everything. Right? And they, they, their affection so- stops. They just kind of hold it all in, and lo and behold, you know, the the most affectionate thing we get from them is an eye roll on a fairly regular basis. And it makes us struggle. But little kids, little problems. Big kids, big problems. The kinds of detours that often derail our lives and send us into deep struggle are as our kids are approaching or move into adulthood, and to make foolish choices and poor decisions and they have consequences and they create all kinds of pain, all kinds of disruption, all kinds of detours. Here's the bottom line. When our kids struggle, whatever age, it can send us on a detour like no other. Today we're gonna take a look at a passage from an Old Testament book called Hosea. In fact, if you will, open your Bibles. Hosea is in the Old Testament. It's about three quarters of the way through the Old Testament. It's one of the minor prophets. So open your Bibles to Hosea. And uh, in Hosea, you need to understand that that God, God is speaking to his people, his children, Israel. And he's using the life of Hosea. We could, we could do a whole series on the book of Hosea. We don't have time for that, but we're going to focus on one passage. He's using the life and the words of Hosea to, to bring to mind, to sort of try and wake up, to, to break through to Israel, God's child, his son, his children, to help them understand how he feels, what's going on as they struggle and he struggles. So I mentioned Hosea is an Old Testament book. It's one of the Minor Prophets. Anybody remember the Minor Prophets series we did a few years ago? Yeah, that's encouraging. Nobody. (laughs) I'm going to try to get over that. So Hosea is a minor prophet, and and that doesn't mean that the message is insignificant. It doesn't mean that that it's not as important or that there's some other uh, value judgment associated. It literally just means that the minor prophets are shorter than the major prophets like Isaiah. Hosea was, uh, was writing in a time, so if you remember, during the reign of King David and King Solomon, there was one Israel, and it was a united kingdom. And then, shortly after the, the death of Solomon, the kingdom was divided into two. There was Judah in the southern kingdom, and there was Israel that was the northern kingdom. So Hosea is living in the northern kingdom about the 8th century B.C., and he's living in a really, really tough time. So In the kingdom itself, it was a monarchy. There had been six kings in 30 years. Several of them had been assassinated. One of them reigned only two months. I mean, their monarchy was in chaos, and they were bad kings. 
Not only that, the Assyrian Empire was this looming superpower to the north and east, and they had attacked and invaded Israel six times during Hosea's ministry. This is a really bad period of history to be an Israelite, really bad period to be a prophet like Hosea. And the reality is that it wasn't really about the national or international politics. In fact, part of Hosea's message was to communicate to the people of Israel that their crisis wasn't with Assyria, it wasn't with the the chaos in their monarchy, that their crisis was all about their spiritual apostasy. See, here's what had happened. The people of Israel had completely forsaken worship of God. Now, they were still worshiping, but they had adopted in whole the worship of the Baal gods, all of the the sexual practices and all of the, the things that were putrid to God. They adopted all of that and they were worshiping and they were worshiping as if they were worshiping God. In fact, the point is they were worshiping Baal and they didn't even know that they weren't worshiping the true God anymore. Now how in the world does that happen? Well, here they are and they begin to adopt some of the practices and begin to incorporate some of the the gods from the, the people around them and they slide just a little bit And they add that to their worship. And lo and behold, they slide a little bit further and a little bit further. And over time, they're completely absorbed in the worship of, of Baal gods. And they have no idea that they're not worshiping God at all anymore. Look what Hosea says as he calls out the sin of the people. There is no faithfulness, no love. Remember, The Bible tells us God is love. There's no love. No acknowledgement of God in the land. So literally, for these people and all of their worship and all of their practices, there's literally no acknowledgement of the God who called them out of Egypt, the God who is their God, the God who has protected and defended them, the God who has given them the land that they occupy. Lo and behold, there's no acknowledgement of him in the entire land. There's only cursing, lying, and murder, stealing, and adultery. They break all bounds. In other words, there there are no boundaries. There are no no rails for their behavior. The Ten Commandments, it's as if they don't even exist. And look at this. This is really kind of the, the capstone. And bloodshed follows bloodshed. This is a violent, ugly, dishonest, horrible people who have completely forsaken God and are living in in this heinous way. And Hosea is trying to call this out. His job is to tell the people, this is your problem. It's not the Assyrians. It's not your national politics. This spiritual crisis is the real crisis. The problem is with your hearts and the problem is with your lives. And to bring the point home, Hosea uses this paradigm or this analogy of parenting. And as I mentioned before, he's trying to help them see what this looks like, what this feels like to God. And so look at what he says as we move into chapter 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Remember, Israel was enslaved in Egypt. And God brought them out of Egypt in the Exodus. This is the cornerstone. This is the hallmark of the people of Israel. It's what they're supposed to remember and look back to every single year to remember who their God is and who they are. And yet they have completely forsaken all of that. I loved him and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals and they burned incense to images It was I who taught Ephraim. Ephraim is another name, by the way, for Israel, this northern kingdom. It was I. Imagine God, what he's saying. It was me. It was me. It was me. I'm the one who taught you to walk. I'm the one who reached out and held your hands as you took your first steps. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. I mean, you can hear the pain in the words that Hosea speaks on behalf of the Father. These people have drifted so far away 
that they don't know who their God is, but worse yet, they don't know who they are. They've lost all sense of identity. You know, in our culture, there is a crisis of identity. There are all kinds of questions that that people are asking. Who am I, and do I matter, and am I loved, and, and does my life have purpose, does it have meaning? All kinds of really important questions. And, and these questions are, go, go to who we are. They go to our identity. As parents, it is absolutely critical that we help our children understand who they are, and who they are fundamentally. Who they are at the most basic and the most significant level. Because here's the thing, for every person from every place on earth for all time, that's the context, the deepest essence of our identity is something that has been given to us, not earned or achieved. Now what does that mean? That means that who we are in its most significant understanding, who we, our identity in its most significant and highest understanding is not something that we do. It's not something we earn. It's not something we achieve. It's not about how good we are or how bad we are. It's not about all the things we accomplish. We can't earn it and we can't achieve it. Achieve it. it was given to us by God. And if you want to help someone understand what their identity is, It's very simple. Go to Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 2. You'll recognize these verses that that I'm going to use because in Ephesians chapter 1, it says, before the foundation of the world was laid, God chose us in love to be adopted into his family through Jesus Christ. What's that tell us? That before the foundation of the world, so before we were conceived, before we were even thought of, God chose us. Before we were good or bad, handsome or ugly, before we were talented or not talented, before we were smart or dumb, before we did everything right or made all kinds of mistakes, God chose us. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. We didn't have anything to do with it. God chose you and he chose you in love. And he chose you to be his child. chose you to be his child at the expense of his son. You say, well, okay, that's fine, but sin enters the equation. And man, the sin in our lives, the sin in my life is heinous. It's all over. It's all kinds of ugly. It's all kinds of brokenness. So how can you say that God loves me? How can you say, well, the reality is that we take Ephesians 1 and then we add to it Ephesians 2 where it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, lest anyone boast. It is the free gift of God. That you and I don't earn it. Yes, there's sin and there's brokenness and there are all kinds of mistakes and all kinds of shame and all kinds of guilt and God cuts through all of that because we didn't earn it and we don't deserve it. When he called us to be his child in faith, he was so committed to it that when we broke the system, he repaired it through his son Jesus Christ to bring us back to himself. But it doesn't even stop there because chapter two, verse 10 goes on to say, for you are God's masterpiece recreated in Christ Jesus to do the good works that God prepared in advance for you to do. Does your life have meaning and purpose? Yes! You are loved by God, you are redeemed by God, you are cherished by God, and he has given you, he has prepared a whole lifetime of purpose and meaning and significance. And dear friends, it's so important that our children understand their identity, that they understand who they are, how valuable and precious and important and purposeful their lives are. And when they struggle, it becomes even more important for us to remind them. If there's no one else in the world, moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, it's our job to continue reminding those children and our loved ones in general to remind them who they are, how valuable they are, how important their life is. 
because you know what's happening all that while. The devil loves to take brokenness and pain and shame and guilt and he loves to sidle in close and whisper into our ears, you are worthless. You're miserable. You're a failure. There's nobody could love you. There's nobody that ever could ever forgive you. God certainly could never forgive you. Your life is an absolute waste, and he loves to bring it to a culmination by saying, why are you still alive? And he is a liar. Jesus said he's been a liar from the beginning, and he's a liar now, and he loves to spread those lies. And we need to be the voice of God speaking into the lives of our loved ones because it's not just our children, it's any of our loved ones. We, we need to be the ones speaking to their lives saying, you matter, you are loved, you are precious. It's not about anything you deserve or earn. It's just who you are because that's who God made you. So now, as we move on, Hosea talks about something else. See, God is lamenting that his people don't know who they are. They don't realize that he's always cared for them. And and look at what he says. I led you with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them, I was like one who lifts a child to the cheek. Imagine lifting that little one up, kissing them on the cheek. I bent down to feed you. We need to be sure that our children know who they are before the hard times come. And when those hard times come, we need to be reminding them over and over and over again. Friends, that's the whole message of the Bible. If you boil it down, that is what the Bible is all about. That's the message of every prophet reminding the people of Israel who they are and who God is and who God called them to be in love. That's the message of Jesus. That's the message of the apostles. The whole scripture testified to the fact that God is love and he has called you to be his child because he loves you. We need to carry that message to our loved ones. Now I want to move on to point number two because this is, this is the toughest point. And to, to sort of set the stage, I just want to, I want to tell you, because some of you know, you've been around here a long time, we've been together a long time, but some are newer to Concordia. And so when I talk about this next part, I want you to understand Julie and I have been on this detour. The most painful parts of my life come from being on this detour with our son Nick as he struggled. One of the most difficult things that you will ever have to do on the detour of children who struggle is set boundaries and stop enabling. Do you know what I mean by enabling? How many people know what enabling is? Okay, quite a few. Just to be sure we're on the same page. Enabling is behavior that, that, allows, that allows bad choices, bad behavior, addictions, to continue. So just a a little checklist. Point number one, enabling is protecting a loved one from the consequences of addiction or bad choices. In other words, you'll do anything in your power to keep them from actually having to, to pay the price for the choices or the addiction. Number two, keeping secrets about your loved one's addiction. Not telling anybody being part of the conspiracy so that no one can find out because if they can't find out, then your loved one's gonna be okay and you guys can just figure out a way to solve the problem. That's enabling behavior. Number three, refusing to follow through on boundaries. You know, if you do this, son or daughter, if you, do, if you take this step, these are the consequences, but lo and behold, they take that step and the consequences disappear because we can't bring ourselves to keep those boundaries. They're terrifying. Number four, making excuses for your loved one's behavior. You know, we love them. They're treasures to us. 
We don't want to think badly of them. We don't want anybody else to think badly of them. So we make excuses. We find reasons. We rationalize, right? That's enabling behavior. And here's the thing. If you and I are going to help our children when they're on this detour and they carry us with them, then we've got to stop enabling. We've got to establish boundaries and live with those boundaries. That's what God has to do. That's exactly what he's saying here in Hosea chapter 11. He's saying, I'm going to stop protecting you. I'm going to stop defending you. You are going to suffer the consequences of your terrible choices. Will they not return to Egypt and will not Assyria rule over them? Because they refuse to repent. A sword will flash in their cities. In other words, it's a picture of of the, the violence of these nations when they invade. A sword will flash in their cities. It will devour their false prophets and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me. Even though they call me God most high, I will by no means exalt them. Again, you hear God's pain. They're determined. No matter what I do, no matter what I say, no matter how many prophets I send, no matter how much I love and protect them, they are determined to turn away from me. So, okay, fine. Even if they turn and say, you are God most high, I've had it with them. Now they're going to pay the price. You hear God's pulling his hair out. He's completely frustrated with the people of Israel. And so he removes his protection. He removes his blessing. He creates this boundary, and his people are going to experience the consequences of their sin. You know, sometimes, sometimes we have to allow our children to experience the consequences of their sin. And it seems so contrary, doesn't it? I mean, it seems so opposite of loving them to let them suffer, to let them be arrested, to let them pay a price, to whatever it might be. I mean, it seems so contrary, but the reality is, if we don't do that, we're just enabling, we just allow that behavior and those bad choices to continue on and on and on. Enabling behavior means there is no hope. No boundaries means there is no hope. It's only when we set those boundaries and stop enabling that things can change. I know you hate hearing that. I hated hearing that. And the reason we hate hearing it is because when all is said and done, this has to do with our loved ones, our children. And the terrifying reality is, what if it doesn't work? It's fear, isn't it? If you are in a position, and there has to be this many people, if you are in a position of having to draw a boundary, if you are in the position of needing to stop enabling, let me give you a verse to combat the fear. It's 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. Perfect love drives out fear. Perfect love drives out fear. So, it's been a happy Mother's Day message, hasn't it? (laughs) Just having a good time, lots of laughter and joy, right? That's kind of how it's been with all of these detour messages. They're really tough. But they're also really important. Because detours are a part of our lives. There's one more thing I want you to understand from this text in Hosea chapter 11. While God stops enabling, while God establishes boundaries and he, and he allows Israel to suffer consequences, the suffering is not out of spite. God still loves his children. God allowing them to suffer the consequences of their bad choices and their spiritual apostasy is not because he stops caring. It's because he cares enough to allow them to experience these things in hopes that it will wake them up. That'll bring them back. God never stops loving his people. God never stops loving us. Look at what he says, verse eight. 
How can I give you up, Ephraim? He's talking again about Israel. How can I give you up, Israel? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma, or how can I make you like Zeboim? Those are two, two communities that were destroyed with Sodom and Gomorrah. How can I do that to you? My heart has changed within me. All my ca- compassion is aroused. Because God is love, with God there is always hope. Because he never stops. With God there is always hope. Love, even in the depths of their apostasy, God never stopped loving his children. And it doesn't matter how far you and I walk away from God, how much we turn our back, he will never stop loving us. You know, as I was thinking about Mother's Day and this message, I was thinking about my own mom. She's in heaven now, and she was wonderful. And uh, I remember a story from when I was a kid, and I remember it in particular because my mom brought it back to my attention some time later. But when I was a a boy, probably four or five years old, my mom was was frantically cleaning the house and getting ready, and she was pregnant with one of my siblings, and and, uh, she was just rushing around. And, and she was mopping this kitchen floor, and our kitchen was kind of a, this long little kitchen that, that went out, and then it went down a couple of steps, and there was a landing for the back door. So if you were coming in, you could either go straight into the basement, which we weren't allowed to do on our own, or take two steps up and come into the kitchen, go into the rest of the house. And so she was mopping the floor, and, and she said, you know what, you have to go outside. I want you to stay outside while I mop this floor. Please, 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 don't come back in here. Let me get this done. And so I went outside, but I didn't want to be outside. And I may have been a strong-willed kid. (laughs) And so not more than a few minutes later, my mom is in the middle of mopping this floor. She has her back turned, and I walk in, and I've got my feet covered in dirt and mud. And so literally, she doesn't even see me come in. I walk behind her into the other room, and so I'm tracking mud through her brand-new a clean floor into the, into the p- part of the house that has carpeting and I'm making a mess. She turns around, she sees it, it's like, oh my gosh, and she lost her mind. <laughs> She's, Billy, I thought I asked you to stay outside. I didn't want to be outside. <laughs> you have got to go outside. This is going to take just a few minutes. And so she, she walks me back through the kitchen, walks me down, and we're on the, the threshold of the door to go outside, and I'm fighting, you know, kind of resisting. And she puts her foot up. So she's got the baby in her belly. She's got the mop in her hand, and she puts her foot up, and she pushes me out. Being a good-natured kid that I was, I start screaming, you kicked me! <laughs> Years later, like... 50 plus years later. I was sitting with my mom and we were all alone and she started crying. She said, son, I have to talk to you about something. I said, okay, mom, what's, what's going on? I have to apologize for something terrible I did. Now, again, I expect my mom is going to be canonized as a saint any day now, so I can't imagine what they're about to say. But what she says is, when you were a little boy, I kicked you. (laughs) And that's about how it went. It's a serious, tender moment, and she tells me, I kicked you, and I started laughing. I said, I remember, Mom, and you didn't kick me. I was being a pain in the butt. But she's still crying. And she said, I just never wanted you to think I didn't love you. I said, Mom, I never did. What a blessing when our moms reflect the love of God. What a blessing when the love of our moms communicate who we really are in God's sight. 
See, we may need to set boundaries. We may need to allow difficult consequences. But the fact of the matter is, as parents, we never stop loving our children. God's fed up with Israel, but he can't turn away from her. Moms, thank you for helping us understand the love of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for your love and mercy for all of the ways that you call us back to yourself. Lord, help us to to have the inspiration of your spirit to, to know and remember who we are, not because of what we earn or deserve, because of who you made us to be. Bless us, Lord, and keep us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, dear friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And as you leave this place, go into the world and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the message of life. Amen. God bless you. Happy Mother's Day.